Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be on the planet. This is World Smart, a podcast of the Aaron Fox Schiff Law Firm. We are your hosts and International Practice Group co chairs. I am Hunter Carter. And I'm Malcolm McNeil. And we'll be talking with you with our partners and special guests about topics of interest in the law of the international business and business related communities. Well, Malcolm, who do we have here today? Well, Hunter, I am absolutely thrilled and overjoyed to be introducing you to a dear friend as well as an integral part of the Chamber of Commerce community in the Southern California area. We have with us Marlon Marroquin. Marlon is the Executive Director of the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce. Besides being able to call her and her husband friends of ours, I can tell you that we've been on a variety of panels together. We have made pre presentations to industry groups in manufacturing, trade, import, export. And when I told Marlon about our podcast, she said that she would love to participate. And here she is. So I'm going to say welcome, Marlon. Bienvenidos. Thank you so very much, Malcolm. You know, as you just mentioned, we're not only collaborators in terms of promoting a different various industries, but also great friends. And it's an honor for me to be here with Aaron Fox this morning. Aaron Fox has been our member before you, Malcolm, I'm sorry to say that, but before you and now with you. So it's a wonderful to be part of this great group. And Hunter, it's a pleasure to meet you as well. The pleasure to meet you as well, Marlon, and uh, bienvenida. We are actually thrilled to have someone from the U.S.-Mexican Chamber of Commerce because there's a lot of issues that we have to learn about and share with our listeners on this podcast. Malcolm, why don't you kick it off? Sure. And Marlon, as you know, these issues are coast to coast. And Hunter is based in our New York office, and I'm in the LA and San Francisco offices. So we're a little bit closer to the border over here, but the issues are still the same. I think what I'd like to start with is where I get a lot of queries from clients over here. They're concerned about the Maquila Doris and its history and manufacturing in Mexico and has it changed over the years. And maybe we could kick off with you giving us a little overview of manufacturing in Mexico at the border right now and where we stand on that. That would be, I think, a good starting point. Thank you very much. Once again, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'll try to share a little bit of what I know, you know, the uh, relationship that we have with the United States and the border in Mexico. So I'd like to start just talking a little bit about what we know very, very much about the situation that happened during COVID that a lot of the problems with the transportation and supply chain that happened. So the companies learned that from the recent COVID pandemic that they cannot rely on just one supplier. So a government across the globe are trying to get companies out of China. Many companies are considering Mexico as a potential location. Why? Because it's very close to the United States, because it's a second partner. We'll talk about that later, but it's what the second trade partner with the United States. People don't want to have all their eggs in one basket. They want to diversify their operations, not only in Asia, but absolutely in Mexico, because only they can sell to the Mexican market, which is a very large market, 130 million people, and also the rest of Latin America. And also, you know, we know that 2018, the United States imposed tariffs to 25% of Chinese goods. Importing goods from China into the United States was very expensive. And three or four decades ago, Chinese labor was one of the cheapest in the world. But recently, uh, it has increased to $40,000 a year which is a huge increase compared to what we had before. And manufacturing in China has become very expensive. Of course, the turnover rate is a big issue. Factory costs, transportation costs. And the maquiladora industry was created in the 1960s. And the solution was to create an advantage of preferential tariff agreements between the U.S. and Mexico and to encourage foreign investment in the country. The maquiladora industry now is referred to the IMEX, Industria Manufacturera Maquiladora, y de servicio de exportación, which is, you know, industry manufacturing and maquiladora and export services. And this is a maquiladora, it's a, it's a company, it's a, it's a factory that is staffed by Mexican workers, but it's owned by and operated by U.S. or foreign companies. So it has preferential treatment, it has low tax treatments, and it enters into originally into NAFTA that it was created in 1994. And now after NAFTA was, you know, canceled in the USMCA, created in 2020. So it has a lot of preferential treatments. So that's a little bit about what the maquiladora industry is. Excellent. Tell us, what are the main industries? Are there main industries or are they spread out? How would you describe those for our listeners? 
Absolutely. We have many different industries like the automotive, electronics, aerospace, medical, and clothing and apparel. For example, aerospace is very large in Mexicali and in Tijuana. There's many, many, many very interesting uh, aerospace state-of-the-art facilities there, as well as automotive. Automotive are more based on the south part of Mexico and in Guanajuato, Querétaro, in that, in that region. And some, for example, some of the automotive industries that we have are, you know, Honda, Mazda, Nissan, Volkswagen, Audi, Ford, Chrysler, GM, and tier one, tier two, and three suppliers in the industry are migrating to the region. Also, five of the 10 cars manufactured in Mexico are exported to the United States in different parts. So the regions mostly are in the border, but we have a lot of maquiladoras also in the south part of Mexico, which is Guanajuato, Aguascalientes, Querétaro, San Luis Potosí. I can tell you that we have right now 6,390 maquiladoras in Mexico. It's very large. They're mostly located in the border in Tijuana and Mexicali, but there are also in the south of Mexico. Let me turn it over to Hunter, and I think you already know that Hunter's practice is quite interesting because it has an expanse through Latin America, and Hunter has a variety of contacts with law firms and clients throughout the region. So, Hunter, why don't I let you take it over, and why don't you find out what you want to know from Marlon? Well, thanks for kicking it over to me, and I'm delighted, uh, Marlon, only for Malcolm's sake, Will we conduct this interview in English instead of Spanish? We have actually done a podcast without Malcolm, unfortunately, but with our partner, Gabriela Palmieri, entirely in Spanish. And that's because the region, the Latin American region, is a very dynamic but very complex set of issues. And so when we talk about maquiladoras, when we talk about the trade advantages of this particular system that has evolved over many years in Mexico, it has a lot to do with Mexico's relationship with the United States. Not only, but, but very, very much. And so Mexico is one of the very obvious candidates to continue to expand its trade chain relationships for the reasons you started to talk about, the price advantages of labor and things in China becoming less of an advantage for China, the logistics issues that we've all seen. But what I know is that other countries in the Latin American region are also looking at establishing their role and helping developing their countries in the manufacturing sector and in advanced knowledge businesses and so forth. And so the whole idea of nearshoring, whether manufacturing or in, in services, I know you know a great deal about and you've heard a great deal about. And I've heard it from you know my friends in Colombia and Ecuador and Peru and otherwise that you know we can provide for a robust supply chain that's sourced much closer to the United States and the consumers in the United States. Tell us a little bit about your perspective on this whole trend, this topic of nearshoring these days, where are we in the business cycle of seeing maybe a shift towards the Americas and Mexico in particular and away from other sources? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there are different concepts. Uh, one is, you know, reassuring, another nearshoring, reassuring the people, the companies that were before had a relationship with Mexico. They left and now they're coming back. New shoring are the new companies that are just looking for potential partners, trade partners, and they found Mexico as the number one opportunity for many, many different reasons. And I'll tell you a little bit about what the reasons are, and then I'll tell you, you know, what we see different with other Latin American countries. Now that I'm not an expert with Colombia or Chile or other countries, but I can tell you the way I see it. So some of the benefits, of course, is the proximity of manufacturing nexus, proximity with the customers and the markets and the impact on the supply chain, of course, that we see. Transportation benefits and cost reduction. Productivity in bilingual labor force. Of course, Latin American countries have bilingual labor force, but Mexico is the number one country that exports engineers in the world. So we have a very capable labor force, not only bilingual, but very smart and educated people. The delivery is also much faster because, of course, it's closer than the Latin American countries. There is also different options for the delivery of the products, not only by airfare, but also by ship or by bus. So that makes it much more efficient. I mean, now we saw the issues that happened during the pandemic with the ports and the merchandise not coming through the sea ports. Well, we have the facility that they can come through the rocks or, or trains or, you know, all that. So that's, that's, that's much better. Also, the rest of Latin America, I mean, I can say that uh, Latin America, I mean, we, we work very closely with a lot of Latin American countries. 
I believe they also have great opportunities to manufacture with. But I think the costs, Mexico also has a very competitive costs with the rest of the world and especially with China. And if you add everything up, I think it's cheaper for Mexico because the transportation is shorter and faster. And that's at the end of the day, that's what the customers want. The clients and the companies want their product to be here today. That's one of the main advantages, I think. Now, in the U.S. Mexico Chamber of Commerce, in your work, what issues are you confronting? What are the top of mind issues for your members in terms of U.S. Mexico trade? What are some of the issues we see every day? We get, or every week, I get many different phone calls from companies that are interested in manufacturing their products in Mexico. So they're looking for partners to move their production from Asia, not only China, but from Asia back here to North America, which, by the way, is called the Calibaja, which we'll talk about that later. That's the very mega region of Calibaja. They're looking for that partnership. Some of the uh, issues that the people are facing right now in the uh, maquiladora industry is that they don't have enough space to relocate these companies. They're trying to build new industrial parks. They have, uh, for example, in Tijuana, there is 68 industrial parks. They're all full. There is no room for new companies. So that's a big challenge. It's going to take a while for them to build these industrial parks. I think Mexico probably was not ready to see what was coming during the pandemic. And another issue is also with the electrical supply that is needed and also the water supply that is needed for the industrial parks. So that's something that I think the local government is working very, very diligently on that. What about legal issues? What legal issues are top of mind for your members when you have events, when they need to find legal solutions? What are, what are the ones they're most concerned with these days? There is a lot of legal issues for, in my experience, what I heard. I think that the Mexican government is very interested in promoting the investment in the maquiladora industry. There is a very well-structured program, the IMEX program. There is a lot of attorneys that work both sides in Mexico and the United States to make it very easy for the companies. And it's very straightforward. I think the major issue will be the facilities right now that they don't have those issues. Maybe the employers, you know, sometimes the rotation of employers is a big problem, I think. And also the water supply and the energy supply, as I mentioned that. It sounds like the maquiladora-focused issues are most of what you deal with at the U.S. Mexico Chamber of Commerce, or are there other big areas that you work on? We have a lot of different areas. I mean, this is one just to mention because our U.S. Mexico Chamber of Commerce, we have 16 offices throughout Mexico in the United States. I represent the California Regional Chapter, which is very focused because of the location where we are in the border with the Mexico, with the maquiladora industry. But, you know, New York is very financial. Every, every region is very different. But mostly we deal with a lot of different issues, also like industries with the tourism and international trade and export and aerospace. We do a lot of programs for aerospace. And, you know, many different sectors. We organize also you know, trade missions to bring U.S. and Mexican companies to do international business, not only in Mexico, but around the world. Malcolm, over to you. Thanks, Hunter. That raised a whole host of questions. And let me start with really what I'll call a nuts and bolts question to begin with. If one of my clients contacts me and wants to know more about Maquila Doris, where would they go? What would be the first thing that you would recommend? And also, I want to give a plug for the resources of the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce, because you have been a resource and many of our listeners may not be aware of it. So tell us a little bit about what you do and how you can help their businesses and also how they might be able to respond to their curiosity over the maquiladoras. Absolutely, Malcolm. The first question, if a company is trying to relocate or look for manufacturing in Mexico, they should definitely come through us, to the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce. We can connect them with the main players, not only in the border cities, but also throughout the south of Mexico, depending on the industry that they're trying to find. We can connect them with the Association of Industrials of uh, Otaimesa. We can connect them with some shelters. The shelters are kind of like a maquinadora, but they do everything for you. It's a full-service factory that they do the accounting, they hire your personnel, they operate your program, they design a lot of things. That's, that's a great program to have. It's very easy for, for the U.S. or foreign companies. So we can connect them exactly what they want. They first need to know what industry they're looking for. And based on that, then we can try to connect them with the right partner. Does that include being able to identify, let's say, the human resources that they're going to need? As you know, a lot of my practice has been focused on inbound Chinese work and other Asian work. And one of the things that clients have been doing as they've 
been looking closer to home is they ask questions like, do they have the resources? And I heard what you said earlier about the industrial parks being full in Tijuana. But I think about those other nuts and bolts things such as where do we find the people? And one of the questions that people ask is, is it safe for my folks to be there? Can I send managers from the United States down there to keep an eye on things? So basically, the the human resources issue is usually what comes up first with my clients. What would we tell them? You know, absolutely. I mean, as I said, we have almost 6,400 maquiladoras in Mexico. That says a lot. And in, in different sectors, it's very safe. It's very safe. I mean, to go, there's a lot of people that work in Tijuana and they live in San Diego, so they cross the border all the time. And these factories are state-of-the-art facilities. People can easily go back and forth. And the shelter concept, it's uh, where, as I mentioned earlier, it's where you can just talk to them and you tell them exactly what you need. They find the location to do it. They know how. They will hire your employees. They'll do your taxes. They'll they do the payroll for you according to all the Mexican laws and everything that needs to be done properly. So it's a very smooth and very easy way of doing manufacturing in Mexico. And we'll be delighted to talk a little bit more about that concept if you're interested in one of your podcasts, so somebody expert that can talk about that. We've been talking right now about the businesses that are looking into Mexico and the Maquiladoras. Does the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce deal with the flow the other way? In other words, Mexican partners looking for work in the United States, looking to perhaps work in Texas. I know with so many clients in Texas who are actually Mexican nationals who actually own properties and do business and have cross-border businesses. What can you tell us about what you can help in that regard? Absolutely. I mean, we are the United States-Mexico Chamber. We're a U.S.-based chamber established by the U.S. laws. So our job is to do inbound and outbound trade. In the case, for example, in Texas that you mentioned, we have an office in Texas, so they will be, we will be happy to connect them with your local office, as well as if there is any other, you know, company that is based in Mexico that are trying to be part of the California business environment and world, we'll be happy to also connect them locally here with our our members. Our members are both from the U.S. and from Mexico. We have also you know, members in Asia and different parts of the world as well. I've noted that from the webinars that I have participated in, and we've been able to give some legal and practical tips on both sides of the border. Hunter, would you like to follow up on that? I know that you are concerned about the inbound work, and I'll leave it to you. Well, actually, as I listened to you, I thought as a practical matter, whether I'm a U.S. company or some other foreign country's company, a concern I'm going to have about Mexico and about any touch points with the government there, either directly or through the maquiladora operators, is going to be the perception of corruption. Transparency International reports on the perception of corruption. Mexico is always very, very poorly ranked in how the business world perceives that it has to deal with corruption. There's even a word for it in Mexico, la mordida, the little bite. And yet, probably to more sophisticated people who deal with business in Mexico, with the volumes of it that you've described and with the number of businesses involved and so forth, When they first hear this question about corruption, probably they say, oh, no, not that question again. We work on it. We have compliance systems and so forth. But I have to imagine you get that question a lot. And so for our listeners, what do you say about that? Definitely. And I mean, I'm not going to lie, but absolutely in Mexico, there is corruption. We know it. But I mean, there is corruption in many other places of the world as well. I think the secret, you know, to do business with other countries in the world is to rely on a very efficient, honorable, or reputable company that can guide you and walk you through all the steps comply with all your legal and regulatory situations that you have to do, and really find the right partner. There is many companies that do business in Mexico, not only from the United States uh, and Canada, but also we have companies from Korea, from France, from Germany, and they do business. They do business very well. They, they've been there for years, and that will really tell you that the secret is to find uh, good partners. And I mean, what can I tell you? That absolutely, there's corruption, but I, I guess there's corruption also here in the United States. I mean, there is, but there definitely is a high perception. Mexico is ranked very low in terms of that perception of corruption and relative to other countries in the region. But I think that when I'm asked that question, and and let me see how you react to this, what I say is you need to have a robust 
compliance plan in place, that there are lots of businesses that are flourishing in Mexico. And that's because they have a robust compliance plan. They take what we call compliance very seriously. They train their workers. There's a a solid tone from the top of the company that is set that we don't tolerate illegality, that corruption in this sense usually means bribery or bribery of local officials. And so we have internal controls to prevent payments like that. And we have internal controls to make sure we know who's a vendor who can get paid by our company to review where the money goes. We don't let company money go to individuals. It can only go to the appropriate authorities or companies in a reviewed and and, and robust way. And once you explain what a really good compliance plan looks like these days, which lots and lots of businesses know how to adopt and to perfect, then the corruption issue does become really very similar in one country to another. But Mexico is a country that has sort of had to endure that perception issue a lot. By the way, so has you know Colombia, so has Peru, so has Brazil, to be sure. But our companies, to your knowledge, to your members' knowledge, are companies having problems making that work? Or is what I said a fair description of how people adopt compliance plans that if they're robust enough, solve the problem? Well, you know, another thing that I'd like to share is that by you becoming a member of our chamber, the company members that we have are the companies that also we recommend you do business with. So we monitor, we investigate our members. We we know who our members are. They're reputable companies. They're people that have been in business for many, many years. I think maybe I've been a director for the chamber for 20 seven years, I think, but maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we had one member that, I'm not going to say their name, of course, that was doing some tourism promotion about Mexico and was asking for money for other companies and they did something illegal. But that's one case on the 25 years that I've been with the chamber. So of course, there is the honest people that we try to really work with the companies and the members that are reliable. And those are the ones that we recommend. But also, you know, as a company, you need to do your due diligence. You need to be prepared. You need to ask questions. You need to go see the factory, make sure it's a real factory because, you know, sometimes you do business with China, a lot of companies send their money to China and the company doesn't exist, you know? What are the advantages that you see for Mexico as a place to set up operations for investments or companies that want to manage a multi-country, multi-Latina regional strategy? Well, you know, setting up a factory or in Mexico or operations in Mexico, not only is going to help you with the United States, but also you can enter into Mexican markets. As I mentioned, Mexico is a large country with a lot of resources. And you can also cover the rest of Latin America by the proximity. Yeah. Malcolm, back to you. I think we're uh, close to wrapping up. You want to have the final word? Yes. Well, you know, I'm listening to this and I just wanted to put it in the context of my experience. And yes, I've had the same issue in China because the perception has been that, oh, if I transfer my technology to China, it's going to be reverse engineered and it's going to be stolen. And I don't have any ability to deal with the legal process there because it's corrupt, et cetera. Much of that perception has dissipated over the last, uh, I would say, 15 to 20 years because the Chinese legal system has gotten more effective. The understanding and belief in the concept of intellectual property has changed, et cetera. But you still have the perceptions that apply. But more importantly, it's the people on the ground, the, the companies that you're going to do business with. And you hit the phrase right on the head when you talked about due diligence. And that is, I think, putting it in a nutshell, you need to have a reliable partner. And if you have a reliable partner, hopefully it's somebody that's already helped you get through these issues of maybe local corruption or local difficulties in supply chain or issues regarding the HR issues and the workers, et cetera. So that due diligence component, I I didn't want to let it slip by. So I guess my question to you is, give us a little bit more about how the U.S.-Mexico Chamber can help us with those queries. If I have a client that's looking at going to Mexico and they are looking for a reliable partner, meaning that they're looking for somebody that they're going to do business with down there, how can you help? Well, there is a lot of companies that are specialized in landing projects in Mexico. They find you the partners, they can do M&As, they find you law firms, accounting firms, they can walk you through the process. And those companies, as I said, you know, it's a partner that you can work with. They take you by the hand, they introduce you to those people. I have to say that the government of Baja California, I've been working a lot with them, with the Secretary of Economic Development of the state of Baja California. They're very, very efficient on doing their right job. For the year, that I've been working with them, I have not seen any case where any company has complained about corruption or lack of service. That's something that is very important to feel safe, you know, and when are you going to put your money 
and who you're going to put your money with. And also speak with other U.S. companies that are already manufacturing in Mexico. What is their experience of manufacturing there? What they don't like, what they like. So just be very, very close to working with the chamber. We can introduce these interested companies in with the right partners in, in every step of the way. Before we wrap up, I wanted to say that one of the great things to talk about about Mexico these days, when it comes to global companies that want to have good platform for the transfer of knowledge and human resources that may want to come and live and work in Mexico and then maybe go back to Europe or the United States, is the fact that now all of the states of Mexico have marriage equality. And this is something that businesses in the United States have been advocating for. I'm a pro bono lawyer who has advocated for marriage equality. And it's really a remarkable thing in all of the Americas, from Canada to Chile, the vast bulk of the population now lives where people can get married if they're in a same-sex couple. So Mexico has really sort of got a very modern approach to its global workforce in many ways, but that's the latest to feature. And I, I just had to say that because I've been representing Mexican couples on marriage equality issues. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, that's wonderful. I think, I mean, the whole world, we need to change our thinking, you know, the way we grew up with some ideas. Those ideas, we need to get modernized and learn uh, the new trends and the new technology and, I mean, all these things. Well, thank you for coming, Marlon. And Malcolm, thank you very much for inviting her. The activities of the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce and your perspective, obviously, you're a very terrific promoter of, of the work you're doing, very effective communicator for it. And it's good to know how you think about things in terms of due diligence and members and approaching the tremendous value add that manufacturing in Mexico uh, in particular represents. So thanks for being our guest today. And yes, I thank you for that, Marlon. And also one last plug for the U.S.-Mexico Chamber. Why don't you give us the best place to go? Where's the website? I'm sure we can all Google it, but where do we go? Thank you. Thank you very much. Our website is usmcocca.org, which is United States-Mexico Chamber of Commerce, California.org. And uh, just, I like to add something. We're happy to bring all these companies that are interested in exploring the opportunities in manufacturing in Mexico, happy to organize a visit so they can see with their own eyes uh, what I'm talking about, because they're state-of-the-art facilities that you would not imagine in the, in the progress and the development. Let me add one last comment on that. Hunter, I attended the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce trade delegation to Valle Guadalupe, and I was able to see firsthand the vibrant wine industry that is now burgeoning in Mexico, modern wineries that will rival the ones that you would find in Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino. And it's amazing. I, I, if I had not seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have known the sophistication of the industry. And so that's an example of the kinds of opportunities and events that the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce puts on. So I, I wanted to give you that little plug because I never would have known and I never would have thought of it but for the U.S.-Mexico Chamber. So with that, I will say thank you, Marlon, again, I, I want you to have a beautiful set of holidays. We may miss you this year because I know you're going to be traveling, but we hope to see you early in the coming year. 